Welcome back to another episode of Elf Podcast. Our guest today is Jamie Gehring, who grew up sharing a backyard with Ted Kaczynski, a.k.a. the Unabomber. She is also the author of the book Madman in the Woods, Life Next Door to the Unabomber, which is today's topic on El Podcast. Thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Jesse. The FBI's pursuit of the Unabomber spanned 17 years and became the most expensive criminal investigation in the history of the FBI. Can you provide a quick rundown on the Unabomber case for those that either need a refresher or maybe haven't heard of Ted Kaczynski? Yes. So Ted Kaczynski was the longest running domestic terrorist in United States history. He ended up killing three and injuring 23 people over a span of 17 years. And his victims ranged from universities to airlines to computer store owners. And he truly held the nation captive for those 17 years while the FBI was searching for this person or what they thought could be a group of people. It seems like you... And your family maybe were closer to Ted than anyone, even including his own family, as he really didn't see them for years. He only corresponded with them via letters or phone. And Ted Kaczynski in 1971 bought his 1.4 acres from your grandfather. And then Ted Kaczynski actually held you as a baby, gave you gifts, had dinner with you. What was the feeling like in 19, was it 1995 when he was finally arrested and your neighbor, it turns out, is the Unabomber? Yeah, it was um, 1996 when Ted was actually arrested and I was 16 at the time. You can describe my reaction as shock, absolutely. And for the rest of the community of Lincoln, Montana, they were also in shock. My father who was involved in the investigation, still had a difficult time kind of reconciling in his own mind that this man that had lived next to our family for 25 years at that point was, in fact, the suspected Unabomber. And so there wasn't one person that I've talked to when it happened or have interviewed for the book that said, oh, yeah, I... I knew that Ted could have been violent or Ted could have been, you know, make could have made the leap to the the eccentric hermit next door to the actual Unabomber. So it definitely came as a shock to everyone involved. Can you kind of set the scene a little bit? You were born and raised there. What was the property like? How close is Ted's cabin from your cabin? And just explain it. I mean, Ted Kaczynski cabin didn't have any running water or electricity, but it seemed like there was a lot of activities going on. Your father and Chris Wade's had a logging businesses and there was a lot of mining operations. But can you set the scene? What does Lincoln, Montana look like during this time? In order to set the scene, let me take you back very quickly to 1971 when my grandfather sold David and Ted Kaczynski their 1.4 acre parcel of land. Uh, My family were ranchers, and they had a ranch close to almost 10,000 acres. And my grandfather decided to sell 1.4 of that, kind of on the outskirts of the property, to the Kaczynskis. So especially in the early 70s, this property was incredibly rural. It's about close to four miles out of town. And when I say town, that's Lincoln, Montana, close to about a thousand residents, one blinking stoplight, very tight knit small community. The property was surrounded by timber, by just towering pine trees, streams, mountains that really, especially back in those days, couldn't even see another structure or another person while you were out there. And while there were some neighbors that came in or, you know, a little bit of development, it's nothing like you might see in like a Hollywood version of this. The sawmill that my dad owned and operated 
was just basically like a two to three person operation. They were hand peeling house logs. They were cutting rough cut lumber, but at a very small level, just for homes around the valley and some smaller customers. It wasn't a giant commercial operation. And while it was only truly like a few hundred feet from where Ted's cabin sat, and Ted would pass by it when he went into town or decided he needed to go to the post office or to the grocery store or anything like that. It wasn't incredibly daunting or overwhelmingly loud. There was some noise, but again, it was a very small operation if you're trying to picture it in your mind. And our cabin, our home, was uh, approximately a quarter mile from Ted's home. And even when, just again to give you some perspective, when the FBI was trying to get images of Ted's cabin prior to the arrest, they were having such a difficult time doing so because it was completely surrounded by these tall pines and snow. And he truly lived in the wilderness in this small 10 by 12 cabin, no running water, no electricity. And to us, he was this hermit that was living off grid. And of course, now we know that he was waging a war of domestic terrorism from that small little cabin in the woods. Throughout your memoir, you refer to Ted as a hermit. What were other nicknames or descriptors that the community you know, used for Ted? So uh, in our own family, he was Ted or Teddy sometimes. And when people called him hermit, it wasn't in a, like a negative way. It was we all kind of just understood that he was he was choosing this sort of lifestyle that appeared very differently, of course, on the surface compared to what he was actually doing. And he seemed very shy, but he also seemed polite, especially in the earlier years. Now, as the years ticked on and he was more immersed in his acts of violence, his behavior did change, but never again to the point where we would have suspected something like this. When you watch some of these documentaries and, and series that focus on the lack of female companionship in his, in his life, and in your book, you have a passage that Ted wrote a letter to his mom and he says, but for 37 years, I've desired women. I've wanted desperately to find a girlfriend or a wife, but never have been able to make any progress towards doing so because I lack the necessary social confidence and social skills. I am tormented by bitter regret and never having had the opportunity to experience the love of a woman. And then in your book, you mentioned that the FBI agent that you were talking to, Max Noel, I believe his name was, shared with you that Ted Kaczynski actually posted a couple of personal ads in the San Francisco newspaper looking for women in the 1970s. And one of his ads reads, Woodsman seeks squaw, wilderness life, write this paper. And then a second personal ad read, Man 36, his cabin in Montana, wants women to share a very primitive lifestyle. As someone that actually lived next door to this guy for 16 years, do you think think that a lack of female companionship was something that set him over the edge? Or is that just Hollywood trying to go with an angle to make a movie? I think it's much more complicated than just female companionship. And of course, that was lacking. And he lamented about how lonely he was and how he wished that he had a family and kids especially in the early 80s in his journal entries and to a pen pal that he was writing. And so that's definitely an element of this. However, it is not what created this person. Um, but in my opinion, it, it really was kind of a perfect storm. There were so many different events in this life, you know, potentially underlying mental illness to begin with, and then his experience being separated 
from his family as a baby around nine months old, his then advancements in school at a young age, and really not being able to connect socially to others and then feeling isolated, and then going to Harvard and having difficulties there. And then he goes to Montana and he he has already started planning for this this revolution of sorts and he knows why he's going to rural Montana and then he completely self-isolates there he removes himself from his family from anyone who cares about him and loves him and isolates from the rest of the community and he's truly just stuck in the echo chamber of his own mind full time completely immersed in his ideals and this campaign of terror. I think it's a combination. And I mean, can you imagine if a woman from the Bay Area answered that ad and showed up in Lincoln, Montana at that tiny little parcel of land? I think it would be a little bit shocking. Even if he did meet a woman, how long would the relationship have lasted? What woman wants to live in a 10 by 12 cabin with no running water in the harsh Montana winters at what, like 5,000 feet elevation and minus 20. Where do you even take a shower? Primitive lifestyle is certainly a, a polite way to put it. Exactly. He, Yeah, he didn't have a shower. I think he possibly would bathe in the small creek that ran behind his home, but very occasionally. And, you know, I don't know if he had the skills or the emotional flexibility to maintain what it takes in a relationship. We'll never know, but it's an interesting thing to talk about and think about. You mentioned in your book that he told your dad, Butch, that he lived on $200 a year. The only bills he had was basically his property taxes and then a little bit of food. I mean, he he hunted squirrels and game. It would have been hard to go out on dates at $200 a year. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) exactly. When he was uh, visiting his family, I believe that was the er, like early 70s, mid 70s. And he had taken a woman out for a date and they went to a French restaurant. And I thought that was interesting, too, because it probably was just that dinner was probably at least half of what he would live on in an entire year. So it's funny you said that. One of his earlier bombs cost $350 to make, and it was a failure. So he's spending basically twice as much on a bomb than he was on on his living expenses. I mean, talk about, I mean, priorities being missed, but that's just a small part of what was wrong with Ted Kaczynski. Absolutely. 95% of the population has an IQ between 70 and 130. A genius is accepted to have an IQ above 130. Ted had an IQ of 167, which is in the top 0.0005% of the population in terms of intelligence, which means out of a population of, say, 300 million people, there are only 1,500 people that would be of the same category of intelligence as he is. There's a lot of serial killers that have this high IQ. I mean, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, who's in the news recently with his Netflix special on him, Ted Bundy, and Ted Kaczynski all were well over 130. For Ted, I mean, he went to Harvard at 16. It's like these people, they're so gifted intellectually that they maybe don't develop these social skills. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, for like elite families or affluent families, they usually hold their kids back. That way they can develop, and then when they go into sports and things like that, they have an advantage. But for Ted and some of these others, it seems like their intelligence really limited them instead of propelling them. Yes, I I agree with that. And it is, it's tragic to think about what potential Ted Kaczynski had. He was a genius. And if he had made other choices in life, maybe the difference he could have made in positive ways using his intelligence and I guess what you could call passion. It's just another tragic layer, in my opinion, of this story. You mentioned before that he went to Harvard. He started Harvard in 1958 and he enrolled in an, an experiment, which was the the MK Ultra. 
the mind control experiments that were going on at Harvard in the 1950s and 60s. And Scott Godlieb, who was the person who headed up the MK Ultra program, said that first, you have to blast away the existing mind. Second, you have to find a way to insert a new mind into that resulting void. He then goes on to say that they needed to find a way to do the second, but they were successful with the first. When you're talking about Ted Kaczynski going to the university at you know at 16 and then already having low self-esteem, low confidence, and then basically, in the words of the person running it, they blasted away his, his persona that was already fragile. And in, in your book, I mean, you mentioned that Max Demel said that he didn't think there was really any connections. And in one of Ted Kaczynski's letters, he was responding to a person asking about it. And he wrote that he only had one unpleasant experience that lasted about 30 minutes, but it would not be described as torture, even in the loosest sense, he said. But that's the thing about like mind control or being brainwashed is the person being mind controlled doesn't know that they're actually being controlled. So he really wouldn't know if it affected him or not, would he? Like, I, I can't imagine those things helping him at all at the very least yeah especially for him first of all he's 16 and his entire um confidence is based on his intellect and so he's already in his life felt very isolated socially and really unable to relate to his peers He's from a working class family, so he doesn't quite fit in at Harvard because of that. He's on scholarship there. So there's already some things working against him to kind of assimilate into this community and to feel the confidence of being a student there. Then the experiments that he participated in I mean, I feel like they were detrimental. Did they create a killer? I can't, you know, I can't say that. Again, I think it was a combination of things, but it didn't, they didn't help the development of this person, in my opinion. And I don't think that this type of experiment would be repeated in a university setting in modern day. He never talked about himself. No one even knew that he went to Harvard. No one knew that he was a professor at Berkeley, right? I mean, it seems like all of those things, it was probably a, a touching point for him that he never wanted to talk about any of that. Yeah, I think it was a combination of things. He's very methodical. He's not going to share any sort of personal information with people that are close to him in this new life that he's created because he is actively maiming and killing people and He's not going to let anybody know about where he's from or his history. So I think that was the main reason for that and just keeping the relationships he had very much on the surface. And there were very small things that he would share. When my mom was approached by the FBI right before Ted's arrest and she was interviewed, she was able to recall that he said that he may have gone gone to school on the East Coast. I mean, there were like very small little things that he kind of vaguely shared. But yes, no details. Nobody knew that he was a professor at Berkeley or that he had gone to Harvard or if his parents were still alive, if he had a brother. Um, well, actually, he would say that he would mention his brother, but no details about David, as far as his name or where he lived or anything like that. Ted Kaczynski's manifesto, which is called the Industrial Society and its Future, he writes, imagine a society that subjects people to conditions that make them terribly unhappy, then gives them the drugs to take away their unhappiness. Science fiction, it is already happening to some extent in our own society. Instead of removing the conditions that make people depressed, modern society gives them antidepressant drugs. In effect, antidepressants are a means of modifying an individual's internal state in such a way as to enable him to tolerate social conditions that he would otherwise find intolerable. Today, it seems like there's kind of two camps in Ted Kaczynski, one that thought he was a genius, and others that, of course, thought he's just a, a nutjob serial killer. But 
he's certainly, in terms of his view on technology, I think we're seeing with AI and social media and and a lot of kids being on these antidepressants and, uh, like, as you mentioned in the book, school shootings and certain other components. On that aspect, he probably was right and was, it was certainly a genius on that aspect. He predicted, I think, a lot of this stuff decades before anyone else did. Yeah, and as I mentioned in the book, there's moments of clarity. There's moments of brilliance that come from this man. And then in the next pages... You know, it, it, what he's saying doesn't make any sense. And then you you also pair that with the fact that he's maiming and killing. It's hard to say that he was right, I suppose, because of that. But there's definitely some wisdom in what he was saying. And in writing the book, I was I was hoping to talk to him more about more modern social issues and his take on things. So yeah, I you can't you can't argue with some of it, but then when there's the other part of this, the killing, the maiming and just his his need for revenge and really his um just hatred that motivated him, it's it's a tough combination. Yeah, I found it interesting in the the epilogue of your book where you where you wrote the letter to him, kind of asking what he thinks about the technology today. And then he, in his letter, he tells you to read his book and go buy it on Amazon dot com. Yeah, I mean that was pretty telling. Obviously, he's he was pretty out of reach, I suppose, with modern day. He's <laughs> at that time he was at Supermax and. He didn't have internet access, so he was pretty far removed, I suppose, from what was going on in the world. But yes, the fact that he told me to get it on the giant Amazon.com was pretty shocking. (laughs) What does this say about what people can accomplish if you actually don't have social media or technology? This is a guy that basically sourced all of his own food biked everywhere, not like he drove anywhere, without having a TV or or the internet. He literally figured out how to prepare his own food, cook his own food, plant his own food. He had a garden in the mountains, and he used his own feces as fertilizer. And then he was able to make all these bombs and figure out a way and all the vandalization he was doing. I mean, if he would have put all that time to good use, he could be the richest person in the world, it seems like. He accomplished a lot in pretty much nowhere with no technological tools at all. It's incredible what you can learn from books, reading books. <laughs> and that's what he did. He he sat in the library and read books. And some of the books that he read really influenced him in a positive way as far as foraging and hunting and just living off the land. And then, obviously, there was the other side of that, and he would be searching directories for his next target. Um, I, I I had a book club last night, and we were talking about, um, there's a photo album that I bring to each of my book clubs, and in it is a picture of the pistol that he made, and we were all chatting about how he knew how to make that. And of course, he's making bombs and figuring out how to do that with experimentation. So I assume it was kind of in the same vein, but who knows, maybe he read something in a book as well about how to make a handmade pistol. When you meet new people, does it come up in conversation that you were Ted Kaczynski's neighbor? You're mentioning the book, you're at the library checking out all these books and on Ted Kaczynski, so she told the librarian, like, oh, hey, I'm checking these books out, just doing some kind of research. But Yeah, I mean, for that purpose, I didn't want to be flagged. I was already, <laughs> I was already sure probably the FBI was watching me because of all of my search history on the Unabomber and on Ted Kaczynski. Um, but yeah, at the library, I made sure to offer that disclosure that I was his former neighbor and was writing a book when I asked for every book on Ted Kaczynski. But, you know, it doesn't come up 
I should say, since I have written the book and it's out in the world, it definitely comes up a lot more. Prior to that, it was pretty occasionally that that topic would come up. Even when people would ask, where where are you from? And we, we would be talking about Lincoln, Montana. Even then, many times it didn't come up that I was the Unabomber's neighbor. But now, obviously, with the book of the world, it comes up a lot more. What are people's first reaction when they hear that? They're pretty shocked. And it depends on their age. Many younger people don't know who Ted Kaczynski is in their early 20s. They're like, oh, what did he do? Who was he? So that's an interesting conversation, explaining who this person was. And then kind of the sad thing about, I guess it's a testament to the society that we live in, is many younger people, when I say, oh, he was domestic terrorist and he killed three and injured 23, and they're like, oh, we only killed three people? Because we live in such a world that there are these massive tragedies very regularly where we see horrific mass shootings and many casualties that were kind of, I think, desensitized, especially, it seems, younger generations who maybe don't remember anything different. So anyways, it always ends up being a a pretty interesting conversation, I suppose. How do you think he was able to avoid detection for 17 years? You mentioned in your book that it was the longest and most expensive search by the FBI. And then in, in Chris Waits's book, he blamed it on the length of it and just the incompetence of the Lincoln Police Department as these cops are constantly revolving through, like, oh, it's a small town, you go there, maybe be a cop for a year or two, because he had so many acts of vandalism that if they were to able to bust him on that, I think they would have figured out a lot of things years ago versus the 17 years. And then if if they didn't print his manifesto in the newspaper, who knows how long it would have taken them to actually catch him because it was his sister-in-law who who recognized, his sister-in-law, like as you mentioned in the book, who he had never even actually met in person at least. Yeah, I mean, the reason he was able to hide from the FBI for so long is definitely there's different elements to this. And we've already talked about Ted Kaczynski's IQ. And I I talk a lot about just how methodical he really was in my book, because otherwise it's almost impossible to understand how this person was able to hide for so long. He moved to Lincoln, Montana in order to hide. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And it was the perfect place because it was a community that would allow you the space if you needed it, but also completely embrace you and help you if you needed that. It's just the perfect rural environment in which to carry this out. And then he wasn't buying his pieces for his bombs at a store or any place that would be traceable. He was foraging for these parts of metal and using wood that he would find. And he would melt down pieces of metal that he might find from an old car at the, on a riverbed or things at the dump and then use them in his bombs that made these bombs incredibly difficult to trace. When he wrote the manifesto and he's writing letters to the editor to try to get it published, he's making it sound like it's a group of people and that he's writing from somewhere in California because he mentions the Sierras. He also would do things like find a hair in a bathroom when he's like in Missoula at the bus station and put that into an envelope or into a bomb. He was, again, just being so methodical and trying to play this game of cat and mouse with the FBI. Do you think it was a game to him? He talks in his manifesto about like the power process and having goals 
his whole identity is wrapped up in this persona. And if he doesn't fulfill that, then is he in his own mind not completing his goals? Yeah, I think I think it was kind of game at times to him. And I believe it was a position of power for him as well. Here he is living off grid with really no resources and look what he can do and look who he can fool. And knowing now, especially from reading so much of his material and trying to crawl in the mind of Ted Kaczynski, I understand so much more of his ego. So I can definitely see that at times it probably felt that way to him. 17 years of being evaded. He didn't have a cell phone, didn't have credit cards, not having a car, not having registration. Never mind the fact that, like you're saying, the bombs were untraceable and things like that is really no, no way to tie him to anything. Correct. And he also, that's part of the reason, too, where I feel like ego and power was part of this, because at the same time as he was delivering bombs and and being searched for, he was also writing letters, like complaint letters to parts of the government. He was completely out there. And then in addition to that, he was committing these acts of sabotage in his own backyard. And so to put yourself, I suppose, in that position and put yourself at risk in that way, when on a national level, you're committing the crimes that you are, is, uh, for lack of better words, just shocking that he would do that. And so, again, I do think that that comes back to ego and power. I think his first bombing was in 1978. He moved to Lincoln, Montana in 1971. And then he basically left for a year. And then during that year, he went back home to Chicago. But then his first two bombings were in Chicago. This whole thing was calculated, I imagine, right? He spent those six or seven years basically building bombs, figuring out what to do. He couldn't mail them out of Montana, basically, so he he takes a bus and, and goes to Chicago, right? Then he goes to Utah, he does some bombings there. I mean, he's very calculated. He's planning this out years ahead of time. Absolutely, he is. And throughout the entire time that he is committing these crimes, he's taking buses to the locations or close to the locations and it's another reason that he's so difficult to trace. He's not mailing these bombs from Montana. He's taking it one step further and traveling with them to deliver and mail. So, yeah, it's just it's one more difficult component of this case for the FBI to solve and pinpoint. I was reading a Slate article, and it says, is a quote from the article, it says, Madman in the Woods, which is, of course, talking about your book, is being promoted as a crime memoir. But the story behind the Unabomber's murders has become resistant to truth. Kaczynski has transcended facts and become an even bigger symbol than before. Do you think this is what Ted wanted? We're, we're having podcasts talking about him and his ideas. Ultimately, by us having this conversation and all these documentaries being out and the books being written, is he winning? Also, in your letter that, that he wrote to you from prison, he basically was like, oh, I'm too busy to even respond to this. Like, you're in a supermax prison. Like, what are you so busy doing? So it's a complicated question because... It was very top of mind for me when I was writing the book. And um, I was very deliberate about, I guess, what I wanted to include from his manifesto, from his writings, because I didn't want him to win. I wanted to tell the entire story, the complete narrative, not just my story, but I also didn't want to make this completely about Ted Kaczynski and what he was trying to achieve. I think by telling this story, and if you've read my book, it's a reminder of the ripple effect of someone's violence. And not not just, I mean, it, 
it's it spans beyond Ted's family, David, his brother, to obviously the victims and generations of people that are affected, that were maimed, that were murdered, that lived in fear of the next bomb. And then the law enforcement, the FBI that hunted this person and lost time with their family and had to completely commit themselves, mind, body, spirit, everything to this case to solve it and just how difficult that was on them and their families. Those are important stories to tell and to be reminded of because so often they're dismissed by the larger theme, which is this murderer, or this killer, but there's so many other people affected. It seemed like it was some things that you had to put on paper and kind of come to terms with personally. Do you think like yourself and your family and Chris Waits and some of the people in the local community have this feeling like, oh, we should have known that this guy was doing these things and years after the fact everything is obvious right hindsight's twenty twenty. do you think people are like oh how could you not know it's so obvious he's committing all these acts of vandalism the one year the vandalism stop was the year he was in chicago i think there's definitely for me even it, just being a kid and being i was 16 when he was arrested there was still guilt for me to work through like did we miss did we miss the signs is there anything we could have done to change the trajectory of this history and his violence. But there wasn't. I mean, there, yes, you look back on it and there are things that you um, are, are made much more clear. But be, it's because you're looking back on it. When you're in it, he's not even one of the, in that time, one of the scarier recluse types that lived it among this community. There were others that were living off grid that people were much more worried about. And again, part of Ted's plan, why he was able to do what he did. And so, yes, of course, there were things to work through, but then there was really just no way of knowing that this person was the Unabomber. To me, reading your book with your dad passing, this really kind of was a way to maybe reconnect with your father in this moment in time. Because it's, I mean, your book certainly talks about your dad, Butch. He's probably the main character in the book, really. Yeah, I would say it's probably a tie between Ted, my dad, and uh, Max Newell, the FBI agent that arrested Ted. But it was... Um, I think it was the opportune time to write this because I was going through so much grief from losing my dad and then losing my sister. And I think that the most incredible art comes from those feelings of just being completely raw and vulnerable. I'm happy that I wrote it at that time, but it was also incredibly difficult to work through that as well. And I will say it's kind of shocking because while writing it, it was almost like I was with my, and it might sound crazy, but it, I felt like I was with my dad and with my sister as I'm writing these pages. And then after the book was published, although it was so needed and cathartic and important, afterwards, I I missed that. I missed being with them in the pages. So it's just kind of a strange part of grief, I suppose, and creating art when you're grieving. But that definitely came through much stronger because of the time in my life, for sure. What is the property now? The FBI went and shipped it off for the actual case, but is it now a tourist attraction? So it was, yeah, it went to Sacramento for the trial. And then after that, it went to the museum. But I think they may have closed their doors when the pandemic hit. And then the actual property in Montana, what is that today? So that has been sold a couple of times, Ted's and David's former parcel. And there was a 
indie film uh, called Ted K filmed a few years ago about kind of Ted's time in Lincoln. And it was actually filmed on the property. And a lot of the scenes were filmed in uh, my childhood home, which was incredibly eerie. But now it's it's just privately owned. It doesn't look the same at all because there's structures on it. And there's actually like actual neighbors out there, people that have built cabins for themselves. And so it's pretty unrecognizable as I knew it as a child. Yeah, that film, Ted K., what did you think of it? I, I watched that and it said it was filmed on location. I thought it was quite interesting. They also focused a lot on him not having a female companion. Yeah, that seemed to be a very large theme of that movie. I thought that the story of Ted during that time in Lincoln was interesting. Every single production takes their own creative license, and it's definitely different than what it actually was to us. But it's in times, it's pretty close, even what Ted looked like or how he acted, how he spoke. So I did really appreciate that. They used a lot of the community members as extras, like especially um, I, I was able to host a talk back on the movie it, at the Montana Book Festival a couple of years, like a year and a half ago. And in a theater full of people, I was able to introduce, of course, myself and my book and then the movie and the things to watch out for and the things that were the same and the things that were different. And then we talked about it afterwards. So it was a really interesting thing to be a part of being so close to the story. And one of the uh, kind of funny things is that in the beginning, there's these um, people on snowmobiles that are riding all around the wilderness and are supposedly around Ted's, Ted's house. And those those outfits are like authentic. They're like people from Lincoln, Montana still had these crazy 1970s, ni- like early 80s, br- neon colored snowmobile suits. It was pretty hilarious. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, even there's there's scenes that still I have a really difficult time watching because there's one in particular where it shows it's my it's truly my childhood home, the log cabin that I grew up in. And it's dark out and it's supposed to be my parents in um the the addition there and they're dancing and kissing and Ted is outside in the driveway in the dark holding his rifle watching and who knows if that exact scene happened but I'm sure scenes like that happened because he was around especially at dark and uh, things like that are just pretty difficult to see up on the screen I suppose. You knew Chris Waits and then you interviewed him as well, but he was basically Ted Kaczynski's only real friend. I guess you could con- consider him a friend. Ted Kaczynski did a lot of his testing on Chris Waits's property and in his gulch. He used a lot of his tools. And then reading his book, you know, Chris Waits, I believe, passed away in 2020. But it seemed like he had a lot of a lot of guilt. He wasn't to blame, but did he ever kind of get past that? It seemed like he had a lot of issues. No, and you know, I interviewed Chris for my book. He was a close family friend of ours. He was pretty open and candid with me. And he, at that point, still was carrying a lot of guilt for really one specific incident. And that was after Ted Kaczynski had sabotaged one of the cabins in our valley there in Lincoln which he, I mean, he cut down the the front door with an axe. He destroyed cabinets. He really attacked this home. After that happened, the police came to Chris Waits and they actually had suspected that it could be Ted Kaczynski. And Chris said, you know, there, there's no way Ted, Ted could, could never do anything like that. And 
really was advocating for Ted and dismissing their suspicions. And he's never, he was never really able to, I suppose, move on and let go of that because he just thought, what if, what if things were different and they actually went into Ted's cabin and what if he was arrested? All the what ifs. And so he definitely carried quite a bit of guilt from that. And then also just opening his own workshop and his property to Ted. He had told him in those early years, like, and that's what a neighbor does in those type of environments. What I have is yours and you can use anything you want because he, again, thought he was this harmless person living off the land and was just trying to help his neighbor out. But he had a lot of guilt from that as well. Yeah, then it turns out this guy's coming in and killing all of his, you know, what did he end up murdering, like five of his dogs? Or? Yeah, in Chris's book, he talks about, you know, his, there's multiple dogs that were stabbed and poisoned and it just really tragic. And of course, he suspected that Ted had done that. You mentioned the movie Ted K. Chris Waits is that he kind of has an unusual voice. Did they get the voice right? The actor playing the role of Teddy K, did he have the look right of that era, of the, say the 1980s and the sound of his voice and things like that? I mean, do you remember his vo voice being unique? Yes, his voice was unique. And I do, I think they were pretty close. I've never heard anybody do Ted's voice that I remember that is perfect and sounds exactly like Ted Kaczynski's. But I feel like it was pretty close, even his mannerisms. There were some scenes in the movie that I couldn't imagine Ted doing or Ted acting that way. But I think for the most part, it was pretty similar. On June 10th of this year, 2023, Ted Kaczynski died at 81, I believe by suicide. But I also think that he was pretty far along with cancer. Do you feel like that gives you closure on this whole thing? And then, you know, kind of secondly, he lived to be 81. You know, you had a sister pass away fairly young. Your dad died at 63. Chris Waits was relatively you know, young as well. It just doesn't seem like life is, is fair. Yeah. I mean, I definitely had mixed emotions when I found out Ted had died. I was actually in London and I had had been shortlist, shortlisted for Best New True Crime Author. And so I was at CrimeCon for the award ceremony and during that weekend had found out that Ted Kaczynski had passed. And there weren't details at that point. I knew that he was sick. I didn't really talk about that because it was kind of private information that I had from Ted's brother. But I knew it was coming, but it's still, even just knowing that he died was a little bit shocking. And I had to kind of like work through why I felt that way. And it was because the, he's inextricably tied to to my childhood, for better or worse. It's just how it is. And kind of it kind of represented maybe the end of an era in many ways and then brought up feelings of grief from losing my father and my sister and all the things that grief does. And so while I was in London, we actually were able to take a couple days and go to Amsterdam. And so I wrote a piece in response to finding about Ted's death and it was published in the Huffington Post, which was like a bucket list thing for me to do in my life just because I love that publication so much. So it was very fitting that I was able to place such an emotional piece of this kind of journey in response to this man, this man dying in, in a publication like that. Obviously, there's reason to believe that he committed suicide and some places have reported that it's suicide. But the autopsy hasn't been complete, so it's hard to like definitively say that it was 100% uh, fact that it was suicide. But I can see if he's suffering from cancer and in prison, he's elderly, why he would want to end his own life. 
I also know that his father had found out that he had cancer and had killed himself many years prior to that. It's not shocking to me, I suppose, that it could be suicide, that Ted Kaczynski killed himself. But I don't think that act created closure. It's still very much part of, I suppose, my history and my life. And I hope that his victims felt closure from this. And, you know, it I, I know that his brother, I'm sure, has very complicated emotions about it as well. He wasn't able to say goodbye to his own brother, and his brother died without them having a relationship. And so that has to be incredibly difficult and complicated. So I got two final questions for you, Jamie. One, just where can people find you, get a hold of you, buy the book, and then the final question is just what is a parting thought that you'd want to leave the listening and viewing audience with? You can find me at jamiegaring.com. Basically, I'm all over the socials, but I'm most active on Instagram. You can always message me there or message me via my website. And as far as buying the book, it is sold just about anywhere you buy your books. You can, of course, buy it on Amazon or you can go into your favorite bookstore and if they don't have it, they will order it for you. So it's available just about anywhere. And then also it's on Audible. So if you prefer to listen to your books, I do narrate it, which, by the way, a little insider information, even when you write your own book, you have to try out (laughs) to read your book. And so I got the part, obviously, and it is available on Audible, and I am your narrator. As far as my closing thoughts on this, I hope that if you read my book, and I hope that you do, I really hope that it touches you. It might might make you feel a little bit uncomfortable thinking about a serial killer as a person, but that's who he was to me, especially as a child. And looking through him through the lens of a child is just, it's honest and it's raw. And of course, as an adult, I have much different opinions and those come through in the book as well. But it's just a reminder as well that every single person has a story. And while those stories do not excuse acts of violence They do not excuse specifically Ted Kaczynski. It is still important as a society to understand and know where someone is coming from or showing up from. It only helps all of us. Thank you so much, Jamie, for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming on and talking about your experience growing up next to Ted Kaczynski and sharing your book, Madman in the Woods, Life Next Door to the Unabomber. Thank you again for having me. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode. I'm